So um, a little bit about me before we dive in here. Um, so as mentioned, I went to school at SOU. I studied environmental education while I was there. And I always tell people I've had a very nonlinear path into the work that I do um, because none of my degrees make sense in terms of what I actually do professionally. <laughs> but um, I've sort of been on a path towards studying natural products um, for quite a long time. And um, originally I'm from Mississippi and went, did my undergraduate at the University of Mississippi. And while I was there, um, I ended up spending quite a bit of time at the Federal Cannabis Research and Development Laboratory um, that's there. Uh, those of you, if you're not aware, um, the University of Mississippi's had one of the only federally legal research labs that can touch cannabis um, up until recently. Um, and so that was my early exposure into cannabis science there. And um, from that point on, I've always managed to spend time in labs. Um, just I've always gravitated towards that and trying to understand plants and mushrooms and what are the chemical compounds in these things? How do those chemicals affect people? How do they affect ecology? Um, that sort of thing. And so when I was a graduate student at SOU, I was also a botanist at the same time, working with the Bureau of Land Management, studying um, plants from all over Oregon. And then um, during that time, while I was still in grad school, uh, ended up getting a job at a natural products lab that said they wanted to work with cannabis. And that really kickstarted my whole journey um, that's led to today. Um, so uh, some highlights um, about me that you may or may not already be familiar with, but I wrote a cannabis science textbook uh, a couple of years ago called Curious About Cannabis. Um, and that's where uh, kind of the brand Curious About Cannabis came from. We now have a podcast called the Curious About Cannabis podcast, where I speak with colleagues of mine, researchers from all over the world that are doing interesting things around cannabis science, as well as uh, just other curious minds occasionally. Um, we have interesting conversations and dive into all sorts of uh, concepts around cannabis to try to think critically and um, come to some better insights about what's going on. Um, I've spent probably the last 10 years studying cannabis in, in different ways, um, most of that in the lab, um, and most of that spent uh, testing cannabis and cannabis products to understand uh, the chemistry of those products, as well as the microbiology, trying to understand what the microbial loads are on plants, trying to understand whether, for instance, mycotoxins are being um, uh, produced by molds that are on the cannabis plant, um, looked at pesticides, um, cannabinoid profiles, which we'll talk a lot about today, um, and all sorts of stuff. So I've been studying the plant from different angles for quite a while. And um, now um, I'm excited because I'm actually building my own lab. So Natural Learning Laboratories is my lab that is currently in the early stages of getting onboarded, um, where we'll be doing work with cannabis as well as a lot of other um, plants and fungi of interest. So some of the main questions that I wanted to tackle in our time together today are, uh, you know, really trying to give you a overview of the landscape of cannabinoid science. Um, and I could have gone in so many directions with this talk, but trying to keep it in an hour, I had to really focus on um, what's really a sliver of everything I could spend hours and hours and hours talking about. Um, but we're going to try to chart what are some of the major discoveries that have happened since around the 1800s that have led to our current understanding of cannabis and how it works. Uh, and then in doing that, we're going to highlight some, some of the core research questions that have been circulating um, primarily since around the 1960s or so that researchers have been trying to tackle. And then what those research questions seem to be leading toward uh, for the future of cannabis and cannabinoid science. And something I'm really interested in in the Q&A after I finish, um, if any of you are um, you know, studying the natural sciences right now and are considering uh, wanting to work with cannabis, um, I can probably give you a little bit of um, perspective and what to expect as a scientist entering um, this industry, you're likely to encounter some unique dynamics that are not necessarily common in um, kind of all areas that you might work um, in, whether it's analytical science or horticultural science or whatever it is. Um, so I'll be interested to hear 
um, from all of you of kind of why you're here, what you're interested in. And, and for those of you that are trying to chart a path into cannabis science, um, I'll be very interested to hear your questions and try to help any way I can uh, to give you a little bit of uh, insight and focus maybe. Um, just to set expectations, um, like I said, I had to really hyper-focus this talk, otherwise I would speak for hours upon hours upon hours. So this talk is mainly going to focus on cannabinoid science with a prime focus on chemistry and pharmacology, meaning what are the chemicals that are in the plant, um, how do they affect the body, and how have we learned about those dynamics. Uh, we're not really going to talk much about horticulture or cultivation, taxonomy, um, industrial applications of hemp. These are all really big topics. Um, and we're not really going to get into any politics or advocacy stuff. Um, and just right off the bat, there are three books I highly recommend if you're interested in cannabinoid science. Um, these are all fairly technical, but um, I still highly recommend them. Cannabinoids, The Endocannabinoid Dome, and Handbook of Cannabis. Those are some of the best books you'll find on cannabinoid science, and they're all designed to be textbooks for college students as well. And most of the information I'm going to share with you today can be found in any of those three books. So um, before we kind of chart the history of things, I wanted to uh, not necessarily make any assumptions about what you already know or don't know about cannabis and, um, and some of the basic science as it stands right now. So we'll just do a brief introduction and then we'll kind of rewind and go back in time and chart things up to the present day. So we're talking about cannabis. What is cannabis? You know, people use all these different terms, hemp, marijuana. Um, it's all the same plant, uh, whether we're talking about hemp or marijuana, it's all the same plant. It's all the same species of plant. Um, they are not, um, it's often mentioned that hemp and marijuana are somehow cousins of each other or something. Um, they are the exact same species of plant. The only difference is legally um, their chemical profiles are different. So marijuana has high concentrations of a chemical compound called THC, which you're probably familiar with and heard about. And hemp is usually um, dominant in a cannabinoid called uh, cannabidiol or CBD, um, although that's changing a bit and we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, but this is the cannabis plant. The cannabis plant belongs to a botanical family called the Cannabaceae. It's often um, kind of mistakenly taught that the Cannabaceae is primarily just cannabis and humulus. And humulus is hops, which is the bittering agent used in beer. And certainly these plants are very closely related. Um, there are actually a whole bunch of other plants that are in the Cannabaceae as well. So I just kind of wanted to paint a little picture here of the relatives in this family uh, there's an assortment of, of trees and, of course, hops being a vine. Um, so the Cannabaceae is a uh, diverse botanical family of which cannabis is just, um, you know, one genus of. When we uh, start thinking about cannabinoid science, um, you know, we're going to focus on these chemical compounds in cannabis that uh, tend to elicit most of the effects that people attribute to cannabis. So I already mentioned THC. This is the uh, cannabinoid that's commonly known to get people high. Um, CBD is non-intoxicating and is commonly found in all sorts of hemp products across the uh, country right now. There was kind of a big CBD boom starting around 2016 or 17 or so that is kind of starting to wane now, but very, very popular compound in the dietary supplement space right now. And another really common cannabinoid in cannabis that we're seeing more and more about on the commercial market is CBG as well. Um, these are the three most dominant cannabinoids you're going to find in cannabis. And technically, um, cannabis doesn't even actually produce these compounds biosynthetically. It actually produces um, these acidic forms of these compounds, THCA, CBDA, and CBGA, and when they get hot, they transform into the cannabinoids that most people are familiar with, THC, CBD, and CBG. Um, a term I'm going to use repeatedly throughout the talk to differentiate between different types of cannabinoids uh, 
Um, I'm going to be saying phytocannabinoid. So if I say that, I'm referring specifically to the cannabinoids that you would find in the cannabis plant versus uh, we'll talk about mycocannabinoids, cannabinoids you find in fungi. And we'll also talk about endocannabinoids, which are endogenous cannabinoids you would find in your body. So where do these cannabinoids come from on the plant? Uh, so the plant produces these kind of oily exudates um, called trichomes. It produces, um, as far as we know, about six different types of trichomes. There are two of them that we know produce cannabinoids. And uh, those are the ones here with the green uh, checks. Uh, what you see in image C here is called a capitate sessile trichome. And the one you see in D is a capitate stalked trichome. I always tell people those terms are easy to remember. If you just think about capitate means a head, decapitate means to lose a head, uh, which no one wants. Um, so capitate sessile, capitate stalked, uh, those terms are hopefully fairly easy to keep track of. Um, and then the question marks you see here are called bulbous trichomes. There's a simple and a complex variety, and those haven't been studied very much. And we'll uh, kind of come back to that at the end. But we do know that these capitate trichomes uh, are the primary uh, kind of cannabinoid factories in the cannabis plant. But there are a ton of chemicals in cannabis, and we're going to be talking about cannabinoids today. And we'll probably briefly talk a little bit about a class of compounds called terpenoids as well, which these make up the most of the essential oil fraction of the cannabis plant. Um, but I did want to highlight that there's a lot more here um, that is, you know, potentially playing a role in what cannabis does to the body. Um, and we'll come back to this as well, because a big open area of research is trying to understand what all of these other compounds do. Um, because we've been so hyper-focused on cannabinoids, but I just wanted to kind of paint a picture here that we're going to really just be focusing on one, um, you know, small piece to the cannabis plant as a whole. And it's also important to acknowledge that, you know, in science, uh, particularly in, you know, medical science and things, we talk about active ingredients or active constituents, and I'll probably even use that term while I speak. Uh, but I do want to point out that um, the effects of cannabis come from uh, synergistic effects from mixtures of all of these chemicals together. So what we know about any individual one chemical doesn't necessarily tell us a lot about what someone's going to experience when they use cannabis. Uh, and that's often uh, referred to as herbal synergy, the ensemble effect, the entourage effect. Uh, you may hear any of those terms mentioned. It's all usually referring to uh, the same idea that these compounds are actually working together to produce unique effects than what you would get if you were to separate them. Uh, and that concept will become more important um, just a little later on. So another thing I wanna highlight, um, I mentioned endocannabinoids. Uh, the human body makes cannabinoids too. It's not just something that the cannabis plant does. And a really basic way to think about endocannabinoids in your body is that your, the human body has a, a, essentially a whole system for producing uh, these cannabinoids in your body and using them to signal in other parts of your body. And it has certain enzymes that help build those things up and break those things down. So you have endocannabinoids, you have chemical receptors that those cannabinoids interact with to elicit some activity in the body. And then you have enzymes that are building those things and breaking those things down. This is a very important basic concept that's gonna play a lot into um, the future areas of research focus that I'm gonna be talking about. Um, and the endocannabinoid system, as far as what it does, um, it seems to be connected to almost everything <laughs> in that, uh, your body does. It's tied into immune system functioning, um, how your body signals for cells to divide or self-destruct. Uh, it plays roles in signaling to your body that it needs to clean up cellular debris in your body. It affects blood pressure, mood, um, quite a lot of things. Um, and one thing that we'll talk about is how this system was discovered um, and kind of where our conception of the system is, is leading. 
because uh, this was actually a really um, uh, a really huge discovery that we're still wrapping our minds around how to think about it. Um, that really is Nobel Prize worthy, and we'll we'll talk more about that in just a little bit. Um, but a really simple way to think about what the endocannabinoid system does. Um, in 1998, when it was first proposed, it was simplified as basically it tells your body to relax, eat, sleep, forget, or protect, meaning um, protecting cells and um, and things like that in the body. Um, so it's a very fascinating system. And what's really interesting about it is that the body usually uses um, compounds that are water soluble to um, do signaling in the body, like uh, serotonin and dopamine, a lot of neurotransmitters you might be familiar with. Uh, these tend to be more water soluble compounds. What makes the endocannabinoid system particularly interesting is that it primarily deals with lipids, fatty things, um, and uses them in what seemed at the time in the 90s when it was really discovered to be fairly um, novel activities. But how do we get here? So, you know, I mentioned we've got this plant, it makes these cannabinoids and these trichomes, and they affect the body by interacting with this endocannabinoid system. But how in the world did we discover this? And, and you know, what's all of the science behind that? So really, really briefly, um, we're gonna cover thousands of years in one slide, um, you know, Humans have been using cannabis for therapeutic purposes um, as long as we have written records, basically. Um, there are some records that indicate um, that cannabis use might extend all the way back as far as 4,000 BC or 5,000 BC, which gets really hard to um, you know, verify and things. I brought this little excerpt out um, of one of the books that I recommended to you, Handbook of Cannabis, because it paints a nice picture all the way up to the 1800s, which is where we're really going to um, dive into things. Um, you know, so uh, cultures have been using cannabis for things like uh, mood disorders, pain, um, even things like uh, earaches and gout, um, trying to heal uh, cuts and scrapes and burns and things on the skin. Um, all sorts of things for a long period of time. And it's only until recently that we've started to piece together why so many cultures have been using cannabis and uh, using it for so many different conditions. And the beginning of starting to understand that why really began in uh, the mid 1800s. So technically the first chemical analysis on cannabis happened in 1806. Um, very, very simple methods of just um, basically distillation, just taking uh, really simple extracts of cannabis and seeing how it boils, seeing um, how different fractions of that extract uh, move under different temperatures, um, that kind of thing. Um, but formal you know, analysis of cannabis and its chemistry is thought to have started right around the beginning of the 1800s, but who really brought um, kind of systematic uh, analysis to cannabis, um, there's probably no one better to point to than William O'Shaughnessy. So uh, this is somebody who, he was a clinician and really back in these days, everyone wore every hat. So he was a clinician, but he also did a million other things <laughs> and uh, basically was just super interested in trying to understand how cultures were using um, different types of plants as medicines and wanted to understand how they worked. So he traveled to India and he saw that um, in India, they were using this variety of cannabis that was intoxicating, uh, but they were successfully treating seizures. And he, that was fascinating to him. And so he ended up bringing cannabis back to England to study. And he started uh, basically making different extracts and giving them to all sorts of different animals, um, humans, including children, which is very controversial, uh, but was not uncommon at that time. And he started to see that in, indeed, um, they were seeing reductions in spasticity um, in people that, that they didn't even have terms for some of these conditions at that time. Just They just took people that shook a lot and tried to figure out if they could make them shake less. And it worked. Um, not all of his experiments worked, though. They they tried using cannabis for all sorts of 
uh, different conditions. And something that's interesting that I wanted to note, because it's something clinicians today are starting to vocalize as well, is that he mentioned in one of his writings that even if it didn't, even if cannabis didn't help fix the problem at its core, one advantage that he saw was that it seemed to make uh, really hard medical conditions easier to deal with. Um, it kind of took the edge off of a lot of, of symptoms, even if it didn't make them go away. And he also noted that in his work with the plant, he didn't think that it seemed as dangerous as um, some people were saying it was. And sure enough, um, over time through toxicology studies and everything, um, he was proven right. So this is really the, the beginning of, of starting to, in a really controlled way, try to look at what's in cannabis, how's it affecting people. And this kicked off a movement to try to identify the active ingredients in cannabis. Um, all we knew at the time was that there are certain fractions of extracts that will cause intoxication and others that won't. And so um, in 1857, there was this publication pointing out that uh, the active ingredients seemed to be in this uh, quote unquote high boiling resin. Um, and they use this term crude cannabinol to describe uh, this fraction of a cannabis extract. And then in the late 1800s, um, Woods, Bivy, and Easterfield, who are, um, if you're interested in cannabinoid science, you absolutely must look up their work because they published quite a bit of uh, research um, trying to elucidate what the single ingredient is in these extracts that was, you know, having these effects. And so initially they uh, got this crude cannabinol and figured out that there was actually one or two chemicals that seemed to be producing most of the effects. They started calling that cannabinol. And then later um, they were able to um, isolate these individual components from each other. And they didn't apply the name at the time, but basically that's when uh, cannabinol and tetrahydrocannabinol were discovered or THC. Um, Throughout, uh, you know, so that was the late 1800s, 1896, 1899, that Woods, Bivy, and Easterfield were doing some of that work. Um, there are quite a few researchers that followed up, um, basically all just trying to get the structure of this molecule corrected so that they could understand what they could do with it. And they made some good progress. Um, they kept getting closer and closer. Then in 1940, uh, Roger Adams is a very famous, um, if you're studying chemistry, Roger Adams is a very well-known name, He's done a lot of research um, in the early 1900s to um, develop uh, like chromatography methods and all sorts of, of different things like that. And his team was the first to isolate and characterize CBD in an extract from hemp, actually out of Minnesota of all places. And things seemed to be moving along really well. They knew they were getting closer and closer and closer to answering why cannabis had the effects that it did. But then prohibition hit in the United States. So um, technically in 1937 is when the Marijuana Tax Act um, was passed, which effectively banned cannabis in the United States. And then cannabis was purged out of the US pharmacopoeia in 1942. Um, and basically at that point, you saw a big drop off in canvas research. It became dangerous to do, it became taboo to do. Um, and so unfortunately at around 1942 or 43 or so, um, we just kind of hit a wall with cannabinoid science and um, it didn't make much progress for a while. And then uh, you jump forward into uh, the 50s and 60s and some interesting things happened. So I don't know how many of you are actually studying chemistry and, or analytical science, but in analytical chemistry, there are several tools that are incredibly important um, when we wanna try to separate compounds from complex mixtures and try to characterize a molecule of which we don't know much about. And the main tools that we use are gas chromatography, high pressure liquid chromatography, and nuclear magnetic resonance. And usually gas chromatography and high pressure liquid chromatography are used to separate 
compounds out of a complex mixture. Nuclear magnetic resonance gives you really um, detailed insights into um, a particular molecule and its um, atomic constituents. So these uh, tools didn't exist before 19, the 1950s. So in 1952 is when gas chromatography uh, first came about and started to be made available to researchers. Nuclear magnetic resonance um, became commercially available in 1959. Um, high pressure liquid chromatography became available in 1967. So after 1959, there started to be huge advances in analytical chemistry. And right in the early 1960s, there was a researcher out of Israel named Dr. Raphael Meshulam who saw these tools that were now available to look at these things. And he was familiar with the history of the cannabinoid research that had been done up until that point. He was familiar with uh, Roger Adams and Woods Bivy Easterfield, you know, um, O'Shaughnessy's work and all of this. And he saw an opportunity to try to use these new tools to continue their work uh, where it left off. And it didn't take him very long once these uh, new analytical tools were available. In 1963, he characterized CBD um, in more detail than had ever been done before. And then in 1964, he did the same thing with THC. And sometimes Mishulam gets, uh, tagged as first isolating THC, which is actually not the case. THC had been isolated before, but no one understood its exact, um, how the molecule was structured uh, or anything like that. And so he was the first to apply NMR to THC to understand exactly how the molecule looks and structured, what it's made out of. And he was the first to identify that THC is actually the molecule that is uh, the main molecule that's getting people high when they consume high THC varieties of cannabis. And this was huge. Um, this finding um, changed everything for cannabinoid science because uh, this was the first moment in history that researchers had a target to study, that they actually knew what molecule was really driving a lot of these effects. And basically from the 60s into the late 70s or so, you just see a ton of THC research start to kick off. Um, a resource I wanted to point out, there's a whole documentary about Dr. Mishulam that's free, available on YouTube, that uh, is really, really good, where you can hear from his own words what that experience was like uh, studying cannabis at a time when it was um, highly regulated and very little was known about it. Um, it's, it's pretty cool to hear him uh, you know, talk about what that experience was like. Um, but basically after THC was discovered, you know, we had this focal point of a molecule that was causing these, these effects. Then researchers want to know, well, how is THC causing these effects? What is it doing in the body that's actually, um, you know, eliciting these effects? And it wasn't immediately obvious that there should be a receptor in the body that would produce those effects uh, at all. Actually, initially researchers, um, because they had done some work with THC and saw that it kind of could act as a solvent in certain capacities, it could um, uh, dissolve certain membranes of certain cells, and they thought, well, maybe THC just um, elicits its effects by just changing the behavior of membranes, and maybe there's no need to find a receptor. So um, it took quite a while for researchers to kind of figure out what to hone in on to understand why THC was eliciting the effects that it was. And despite the uh, kind of animosity that the cannabis industry often has towards pharmaceutical companies, we can actually thank Pfizer for figuring out um, how this works because Pfizer, um, after THC was discovered, Pfizer developed a whole bunch of synthetic cannabinoids to try to expose different tissues and things to these cannabinoids in hopes that they would find something <laughs> and that could lead to, you know, more drug development. Um, unfortunately, they, they couldn't quite figure it out and they kind of um, started to shift in other directions and they gave away some of their um, synthetic cannabinoids to the research community to play with. 
And it didn't take very long after that. And uh, there's a researcher named Elin Howlett, who uh, she's grossly forgotten in the story of, of cannabis research. But her team is the one that in 1988 discovered that this synthetic cannabinoid was actually interacting with a protein um, that they had isolated. And that protein initially got dubbed Howlett's receptor. And then it would later be termed the cannabinoid type one receptor. And as they started to investigate this receptor more, they found that it was located all over the brain and that it was the primary receptor that was being stimulated that was causing um, most of the effects attributed to THC. Um, so after that discovery, you started to see cannabinoid research start to focus on THC and CB1 receptors and trying to understand those, those dynamics. And researchers immediately asked the question, why is this receptor here? Because there was no known compound that the body makes endogenously that was known to interact with this receptor. And um, when you don't know what the uh, compound in the body is that would normally interact with the receptor, you call that receptor an orphaned receptor. It just means that you don't know what <laughs> what a ligand goes with that receptor. And a ligand is, is just a chemical that interacts with a chemical receptor. Um, but in uh, the early 1990s, that changed. So the first endogenous cannabinoid was discovered in uh, 19, uh, well, it's debated, but sometime between 91 and 93 um, is when anandamide was discovered. And it was a very crude series of experiments that found it. Um, they basically took pig brains and slice them up and made slurries out of them and expose them to uh, CB1 receptors. And they found fractions of these brain slices that would, um, would bind the receptor. And so they just kind of narrowed in, narrowed in, narrowed in more and more and more, and eventually found a narrow fraction of these brain slices that was causing the activity, um, but it was short-lived. So they learned that whatever the active constituent was that was in there is very sensitive to degradation. Once they learned that and properly took care of the sample and protected it, um, that's what eventually led them to discover this compound called anandamide. And then in 1993, that's when they discovered the second cannabinoid receptor, the CV, uh, the cannabinoid type two receptor. Uh, which is just slightly shorter than the CB1 receptor. And once the cannabinoid receptors were discovered, um, you saw a huge rush to develop synthetic cannabinoids that could manipulate these receptors in different ways. And that was really important because in, in a research lab, you use these synthetic compounds to push receptors into abnormal states of activity so that you understand how they behave and and um, how you might be able to take advantage of those effects um, in different ways. Um, and so I, I have here kind of a look at cannabis research from 1970 to 2020. And just to mark where we are in this chart, you can see that we're right at the beginning of almost an exponential growth curve um, for cannabis research, because you start to get these pieces of the puzzle starting to fit together that okay, we've studied cannabis, we've studied the extracts, we've identified THC, we've figured out that there's a receptor in the body, and we figured out that there are endogenous compounds in the body that interact with that receptor. So once you've put that puzzle together, uh, things just start to explode. There's so many different things to, um, to look at. And then in 1995 is when the second endogenous cannabinoid was, was discovered, 2-AG. And I always like to say anandamide has this nice, awesome name because it was the first endocannabinoid discovered. It has this root in ananda, which means bliss in Sanskrit. So it often gets called the bliss molecule. What's funny is that 2-AG is actually way more prevalent in the brain and is way, has far more potent activity at CB1 receptors and CB2 receptors than anandamide does. And yet 2-AG gets this really lame, just abbreviation. Uh, with no fancy name at all, um, even though it's actually doing way more work than anandamide is. Uh, it's just kind of a funny thing. So then this big moment comes in 1998, 
Um, so in 1998, if you go on Google Scholar and you search for endocannabinoids and you limit your search just to 1998, you'll see quite a few papers uh, that were all published in this one year. And that's because this is the moment where things really clicked. Um, this is when the concept of the endocannabinoid system was first proposed. This is when the concept of an entourage effect where there may be compounds that seem inactive, but when they're administered together, they have uh, unique activity at these cannabinoid receptors. It's the first time you ever see that term entourage effect published. And then just a few years later from that is the first time you see um, this concept of a clinical endocannabinoid deficiency proposed, um, which is uh, on the, the clinical side. This medical doctor, Dr. Ethan Russo, is a very uh, now famous cannabis researcher. Um, you know, in taking all of this data in, he speculated that, hmm, if all of this is the case, then there are probably disorders in the body that are caused by dysregulation of the system. Um, you know, what happens if a person is deficient in endocannabinoids or they don't express cannabinoid receptors correctly? Um, and this is, you know, going back to this little chart here showing these research studies, um, this is where you just start to really see this, this incredible pace of discoveries happening. And everything seemed good. Um, by the really early 2000s, you have this nice narrative that seems to make total sense. Cannabinoids produced by the cannabis plant, they interact with cannabinoid receptors, um, the clouds are parting and everything's clear. Um, but unfortunately, CBD threw a wrench in this narrative um, because CBD uh, is one of the most dominant phytocannabinoids in the cannabis plant. And it actually does not interact with cannabinoid receptors much at all. It has very, very, very low affinity for cannabinoid receptors. And this made researchers scratch their heads and say, well, what does this mean? Is this a cannabinoid? What does it even mean to be a cannabinoid if you know, we have this compound that's, uh, that we call a cannabinoid that doesn't even interact with cannabinoid receptors? And in studying CBD, researchers discovered that there were a ton of other receptor types and enzymes and things in the body that this compound was interacting with. And this sent a lot of researchers back to the drawing board because it really complicated the whole story that was developing about how cannabis works. Um, to complicate things further, we started discovering more endocannabinoids and learning that similar to CBD, a lot of these endocannabinoids exhibit effects on a lot of different receptor types. And some of these things that we are starting to consider endocannabinoids also don't have much affinity for cannabinoid receptors. So what's going on? Um, in the mid, so around 2005 to 2010 uh, timeframe, we start to discover that some compounds that had been previously studied in um, clinical research and everything, particularly different derivatives of fatty acids, um, tended to change the way cannabinoids affected the body. And this led to a concept called endocannabinoid congeners or congeners, um, basically these compounds that don't interact with cannabinoid receptors, but influence the activity of other things at cannabinoid receptors. But this is mind blowing because there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of fatty acid derivatives to study in the body. And um, this was a concept that hadn't been appreciated before. So you start to see this frontier starting to open up around cannabis and cannabinoid research. And some of these I want to point out because you may or may not be familiar with them already. Uh, one example of an endocannabinoid congener is PEA, which is sold as a dietary supplement that you can buy right now. Um, it's uh, There are formulations of it that have been used as pharmaceuticals. And it's already well known to have anti-inflammatory effects, analgesic effects, meaning pain relieving effects. Um, and it has activities at a lot of the same receptor targets as CBD. Uh, another one is OEA um, and very similar activity at the same types of receptors, um, also sold as a dietary supplement. Um, so PEA and OEA start to get a lot of attention. And today there's quite a bit of research looking into understanding how these compounds uh, 
influence the activity of cannabinoids. So now we're starting to get into modern day and um, kind of where researchers' heads are at. We also started to discover that there are a lot of things that don't fit the normal schema of an endocannabinoid um, that probably should be considered endocannabinoids. And one of these are lipoamino acids, these lipids that have amino acid heads on them. Um, a lot of these tend to exhibit effects very similar to either cannabinoids or cannabinoid congeners. And um, another one that I want to show you, a couple others that have been discovered lately, is that there are also these fatty compounds that have uh, what would be considered traditional neurotransmitters attached to them. So there are these uh, what are called n dopamines. You don't need to remember any of the technical lingo here, but just recognizing that um, you're probably familiar with dopamine. This is basically an endocannabinoid with dopamine attached to it. There's also a version for serotonin as well. And these, uh, I do want to speak on um, the n serotonin compounds because these compounds exhibited a unique effect that hadn't been seen before in that these compounds were able to uh, stimulate certain receptors in the body and kind of suppress other receptors in the body where normally cannabinoids would activate both. So um, I'm trying to think of the best way to describe this uh, without using super technical terminology. Um, but basically this compound could block um, what are called capsaicin receptors, which are the same receptors in your body that get activated when you eat hot peppers and it makes uh, that spicy feeling. Um, there's, those receptors are TRPV1 receptors. Normally cannabinoids activate those receptors, but this compound actually antagonizes them or suppresses them. While at the same time, it has this effect of elevating um, endogenous cannabinoids in the body. That's a very rare effect. And it's hard to appreciate without really diving into all the details of what led to this, but that's a very unique effect that has spawned uh, a whole new class of drug development that just started to play out in the 2000s. Um, but all of this leads to a good question um, that we're all, all of us working in this field are wrestling with right now in the 2010s, which is what is a cannabinoid? Um, we've tried to define it as, you know, something derived from cannabis, um, but we're finding cannabinoids and other things. Um, we've tried to define it as things that interact with cannabinoid receptors. But as we've mentioned, there are cannabinoids that don't interact with cannabinoid receptors. Um, and then there's this kind of last bit of, um, of dogma that we've held on to of, well, at least cannabinoids have to be fatty. They have to primarily be fatty in order to, to be cannabinoids. But is that true? Some really modern research has shown that um, certain peptides also uh, stimulate cannabinoid receptors as well. And if you're not familiar with what a peptide is, it's just a long chain of amino acids. And this has created a whole new class of cannabinoids called pepcans or peptide cannabinoids. And peptides are not uh, fatty. I mean, they have a lot of carbon in them and hydrogen in them, but there's a ton of oxygen, a ton of nitrogen. Um, they're very water soluble, um, but they exhibit activity at cannabinoid receptors. Um, this is confusing, uh, to say the least. Um, some other examples of non-lipid cannabinoid candidates in turkey tail mushrooms, there's a compound called polysaccharopeptide. It activates CB2 receptors. It is not fatty. And um, this is another one where we're trying to wrestle with how to categorize this in this context. Also, a lot of polyphenols interact with cannabinoid receptors. Um, uh, some examples of polyphenols you might be familiar with are um, a lot of the pigment compounds in plants that produce purples and blues and reds and pinks and basically all the non-green colors you see in plants. A lot of those are polyphenols and um, some of them uh, do exhibit activity at cannabinoid receptors. And then there's another element to this um, that within the past several years, there's been a focus on looking at the activity of the metabolic products of cannabinoids. So if you feed someone a cannabinoid and their liver metabolizes that to something else, 
what does that do? And it turns out a lot of metabolites of endocannabinoids and cannabinoids also have activity at cannabinoid receptors and other um, similar uh, sites of action. Um, and so this has led into the realm of uh, pro-drug research around cannabinoids. And the concept of a pro-drug just means that you're giving somebody something so that their body will metabolize it into the active drug that you actually want them to, um, you know, to experience or ingest. Um, so this is another emerging area of research that is very new and very fascinating. And it doesn't just relate to endocannabinoids like I have written here, um, but also phytocannabinoids, THC. Um, there are a number of metabolites of THC that exhibit their own activities. And now researchers are trying to figure out how to um, take advantage of that and uh, utilize those metabolites as their own drugs. And then coming back to this concept of their entourage effect, um, there's a lot of research going on today trying to understand why if you take THC and CBD and mix them together, you get different effects than if you just administer THC or just administer CBD, or if you mix cannabinoids with other fractions from the cannabis plant like terpenes, why do you get unique effects compared to if you don't? Um, these are three really good papers that if you're interested in this idea and um, want to be involved in that type of work, I definitely recommend looking up these three papers. Um, there's been a lot of speculation about synergism around cannabis for a long time, but not a lot of good research um, until recently. And it's there's still a lot of unknowns there. Um, we still don't know how these dynamics work. And um, so it's a huge, huge area of research. One thing, uh, one paper on here on the right, the overcoming the bell-shaped dose response of cannabidiol paper, um, that's a pretty interesting paper I recommend looking at where they, the researchers just looked at inflammation signaling in the body and found that if they administered CBD by itself, they basically saw a plateauing of effects after a certain dose and then they started to see negative effects if they kept ramping up the dose. But if they administered um, extracts of cannabis that had the diverse phytochemistry uh, that's represented in the plant, they didn't see that same effect. They could keep giving higher doses and getting better and better responses. Um, so that's what that's referencing of overcoming the bell-shaped dose response curve. And so that's some early preliminary evidence to show that this isn't just a kind of colloquial thing um, that gets talked about, but there is some real science there to look at. Um, and I spoke to uh, one of the lead cannabis researchers in the world, Dr. Vincenzo DiMarzo, um, on the Curious About Cannabis podcast and asked him about this concept of how do we study the pharmacology of a plant? And he was like, I don't know, because <laughs> you're talking about, you know, potentially thousands of chemicals in varying uh, configurations, combinations, administered in different formulations, different ways. Um, it's really, really challenging to study. And um, the good news for students like yourselves is that um, what he told me is that it'd probably take two or three human lifetimes to start to begin to um, piece that together. So you have lots of work ahead of you if you're interested in that. Um, and then uh, some other things I wanted to point out here, uh, you know, cannabinoid research is definitely moving far beyond cannabis. Now, I wanted to point out two plants to you that have some interesting compounds in them um, where we can benefit from the insights we've gained from cannabinoid science. Uh, one is there's a species of rhododendron that produces these compounds, uh, ferruginine. And the structure of these compounds, especially uh, ferruginine C, which is number three on this image here, is remarkably similar to CBD. And so this leads to questions um, regarding what do these compounds do? Do they have activities similar to CBD? And something that researchers are really trying to hone in on right now is what can you predict based on the shape of a cannabinoid molecule? And something that has a pattern that has seemed to emerge is that cannabinoids like CBD um, tend to have activity at TRPV1 receptors. They tend to not be intoxicating 
Um, and so this is an area of research where uh, people are starting to look at ferruginine C and similar compounds and wanting to know, do those have activities at capsaicin receptors? Do those, you know, have some therapeutic value? And then there's a flower from South Africa that's gotten a lot of attention, uh, the Celochrysum species that originally got reported to actually have CBG in it, uh, cannabigerol, which is present in cannabis. And upon subsequent follow-up research, they found that um, they couldn't find CBG proper, but they found a slightly um, uh, modified form of CBG called um, heli CBG. And they also found these other cannabinoid-like compounds um, in this plant that they hadn't found in cannabis. So, and this is kind of where I'm at. Um, you know, I'm extremely interested in turning the lens that has been applied to cannabis for so long and starting to look through that lens at other natural products and trying to understand what we can decipher about them and, and their chemical constituents and trying to look for cannabinoids in other plants. Um, another thing I wanted to point out, you know, I mentioned mycocannabinoids. Um, white truffles seem to have anandamide in them, as well as some of the same metabolic enzymes that our bodies have for um, producing endocannabinoids. So it seems to some degree that fungi actually even have endocannabinoid systems. What they're doing with those compounds is a very speculative endeavor to take on. Um, but we are finding these compounds in other organisms, and we have no clue what they're contributing to in these organisms. So huge areas of research to be taken on there. And then our basic understandings of around endocannabinoids and the endocannabinoid system is providing new ways to think about um, how our diet and our movement and other things affect our health. And we're realizing that the endocannabinoid system is this critical piece um, to understanding why uh, diets rich in certain fatty acids or why uh, regular movement and things um, start to influence things like chronic inflammatory conditions and things like that. So a lot of researchers are now specializing in just understanding how other activities influence these cannabinoids. So this is where we're at today. You know, we're in 2021 um, at the height um, of a wave that keeps growing around cannabis research. And all of you are in a really exciting time because, you know, I graduated, um, you know, not that long ago, six years ago or so. And when I was going through both my undergrad and my graduate work, uh, there was no hope of getting into this type of work, really. There was no clear avenue to study these compounds. Um, my story and how I got into all of this, like I said, is very nonlinear. I'm just lucky really that I got into the position that I did and have had the opportunities that I have. Um, but all of you have immense opportunity to take part in this. And even if there are people on this call that maybe aren't um, part of the school um, that are just listening in, there's so much opportunity to contribute to this growing um, knowledge set um, that we're building around how cannabis works, how it influences the body, and what that tells us about other natural products and how they affect the body. Um, so I think it's important to recognize that opportunity and how special it is that most generations before you have not had that chance, really. Um, and I wanted to point out a couple of researchers that I particularly like that if you're interested in all of this, I definitely recommend you follow. Um, there's quite a few here. I'm not going to list them all off, but certainly pay attention to these names. There are many, many more I could have listed, but definitely, um, you know, go look these folks up, especially Raphael Mishulam, Olin Howlett, uh, Vincenzo DiMarzo. Um, I'd say those are probably my top three. Um, but if you're wanting to kind of um, tune in to, um, you know, the current state of research and everything, just be following these folks. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to leave the slide up. I don't plan on reading it all, but you know, in thinking about some of the low-hanging research fruit out there, um, these were some things that that popped into my mind, and a lot of them we kind of covered as I went through here. But some important ones I wanted to uh, point out here on the bottom. There's two big problems in cannabis research right now that need to be tackled. 
that if you're thinking about getting into research, I encourage you to uh, take these issues seriously, which is one, there's no current standardization of analytical methods for testing cannabis products for their chemical constituents or even testing for endocannabinoids and that sort of thing. There are lots of methods out there, but different labs use different methods. Um, when it comes to data that's generated from the commercial cannabis industry, I say take that data with a grain of salt because there are a lot of market factors at play that unfortunately influence labs to bias their data sets, particularly in terms of looking at cannabinoid constituents, terpenes, and that sort of thing. Labs are legitimately incentivized to boost numbers. Um, and we can talk more about that in the Q&A, um, but just recognize the data sets that exist currently in the industry are not reliable. And so that's a huge um, area of work that needs to have some attention brought to it. It's just standardization of methods, improvement of methods, and then also reproducibility. Most of the research that I've touched on, and there, obviously there's millions of things I, I skipped over in this talk, but most of it has not been reproduced. So if you're thinking about research you want to do, even if you're looking at studies, and you're like, oh, this has already been done before, it needs to be done again. Like a lot of these studies need to be done again to know whether we can even trust the initial results of the first study. Um, without reproducibility, you don't have science really. I mean, it, studies and their findings, they have to be reproducible. Um, so that's a major area I wanna shine light on is that if you have the chance to reproduce a study, it's, it's common, especially when you're a graduate student and wanting to do something impactful, it's common to feel like reproducing a study is like you're not doing something of value or something. Um, and I've definitely experienced that, you know, when I was in school and I want to just really point out how important it is to reproduce even simple studies that have not been reproduced before, just so that we can trust the information and the insights that we're, you know, trying to glean from them. Um, so I know that in this short time frame, I've thrown a lot out at you and used a lot of terms and things. I'm glad this is getting recorded because um, there's certainly a lot to go back on and I'm trying to condense a ton of stuff in a very short time frame. But I, I hope that this gives you some sense of, you know, if you're thinking about stepping into cannabinoid science and cannabis research, it gives you some sense of what's come before you and, you know, kind of where you fit in this, um, you know, narrative as it rolls out, um, you know, indefinitely into the future. Uh, cannabinoid science is, is huge. It's a huge field that is rapidly expanding that's not going to slow down. Um, so we need all of the help we can get from anyone who's passionate about studying these things and trying to unpack all of the immense nuance and complexities um, that are embedded here. Um, but uh, with that, I'll go ahead and stop rambling and hopefully I haven't gone too far over time and 